Through our eyes, the universe is perceiving itself. Through our ears, the universe is listening to its harmonies. We are the witness through which the universe becomes consciousness of its glory, of its magnificence. Wow, I love that. So tell me this, the universe become consciousness. What that means to you? I think, I mean, first, you know, it's like we don't know what consciousness is for ourselves. You know, we, there's, there's no, there's studies of it. People try to understand it, but, you know, it's sort of this, I mean, there's even arguments as like, where, where does it exist in our body? If it exists in our body, is it generated from here? Is it out somewhere else? So I think the universe experiencing itself through us is the sort of way to connect with something bigger than ourselves. And um, it just lets, it's, it's sort of comforting letting you know that you are bigger than you think. And also more, maybe more important, your experience, your life, all of it, and you're connected with everything else. So it's just this very, I don't know, I find it really comforting. I just, you know, sometimes when you're all you're caught up in your life and maybe like times are hard or um, really busy or whatever, it's just like a nice little reflection moment to think, you know, things are bigger than this. And um, yeah, maybe just don't take it so, so seriously or um, yeah, look at the bigger picture. Are you often find yourself looking at the bigger picture, like really exercising those bigger thoughts and experiences in your head? Yeah. Um, I like to zoom out. I think, you know, like it's, it's tough because sometimes when I think sometimes when you think about like the bigger picture, there's this element of um, maybe this element of the future, but yeah, it just, it helps me to kind of get a grasp on things a little bit better. Sometimes like even in, in all different levels of, life like in the studio for example if i'm working on a show or i'm really deep in a project i'm so focused i'm so honed in on something and it helps to take a step back and look at that bigger picture and think you know maybe where does this fall in place with everything else and if i'm stressing about something is it is that is it that big of a deal maybe it's not you know and um to sort of help yourself out by by looking at the bigger picture. And then there's also, you know, um, like sometimes if you feel like maybe what I'm doing isn't, <clears throat> isn't important or isn't worth it. Um, yeah. When you zoom out, it's like, Oh, well, you know what? It's just life. You know, it's just like an experience. It's just something happening. You know, I, I'm getting a sense here that you are someone who likes to exercise those deep conversations, those deep thought. Is that something that you had as a kid as well? Were you always a curious, like, more like uh, maybe uh, a tour beyond your age kind of kid or is something you develop <laughs> late in life? I would say yes. Um, so I'm an only child and I didn't really grow up around other, I mean, I went to school, of course, but I didn't, in my after school life, I didn't grow up around other kids. And I think I picked up a lot of what was going on around me with the adults. And so when I would have conversations with other, with adults, they'd be like, oh my gosh, you're like a little tiny little tiny adult. Um, so in that way, yes, I think like I, I came off as a lot more mature. Um, curiosity. Yes. I was always asking questions, always curious about like the world around me. Um, I don't know if, I don't know if I could say that I was like more philosophical or, um, like was thinking deeper, uh, as a kid. Cause you know, that's, I don't know if you recognize that as a child, you know, you're just, you're just still taking in so much information, um, but yeah, I think so. What it was like for you, uh, like your childhood after school, what were you doing when you were in class? Were you, uh, friends playing and you said you were engaging with a lot of adults and asking questions, being curious, but what do you remember the most when you were like between 10 and 12 year old? Mm, 10 and 12. Those are pretty formative years. Um, I, I think, I mean, I remember reading a lot. I read a lot as a kid. I still read. Um, just, I can't take, I don't take in as much uh, volume as I used to, but yeah, I remember reading a lot, um, playing outside, like running around the neighborhood with like kids from the neighborhood. Um, I remember being very like crafty, uh, wanting to just decorate everything, anything I had, I wanted to decorate it or color it or change it in some way to make it mine. 
Yeah. So it was, it was important to you to, to, to make it yours. I like what you said. I wanted to make it mine, mm -hmm. to have your own vision, you know, to kind of have control perhaps a little bit. I don't know if it was, I wouldn't attribute it to wanting control. I think it was just wanting maybe, maybe like a dissatisfaction with what was the, the basic, like the, um, what was given me. So like, if it was like a folder or a binder or a school, like some kind of school supply, you know, there's only so many choices, there's only so many colors and then wanting to uh, make that more somehow. So by like adding stickers or um, drawing on it or whatever. At what point that the satisfaction became uh, an outlet for creativity in terms of thinking about your own work in art, you start pursuing to not only change things, the way you like to see it, but also create things that you didn't even know was possible and start experimenting with that idea as well. I feel like I've always been, I've always leaned towards that. Um, like when I was a kid, I like younger than 10 to 12, I was always drawing. Um, and, and I remember like getting a lot of positive feedback from my peers, you know, them being like, oh my gosh, like you're so good at drawing. And so of course, you know, I think like when you get those kinds of, that kind of validation as a child, it really like helps um, propel you towards something. So I remember getting those kinds of compliments and liking that feeling, you know, and then of course, like my mom was also very creative. So it's always been there. Um, and then as I got, as I grew up, like got older and, uh, I guess school started offering more, more art classes. That's when I sort of started to use it as a, you know, to like, to like do something with it other than just like decorating the things around me. Uh, but at what point or what age were you, they realized that, you know, being an artist is a career or you could pursue oh. a life that way, a career that way. It wasn't until I was much older. Um, so yeah, I would say in, when I got to college, you know, um, I wanted to major in art, but uh, my mom was like, no, you can't do that. That's too, that's too much of an unsure thing. So we compromised on doing graphic design. Um, but I did that for a year and it was really, really tough. And so at that point I told her, I was like, I need to, I have to switch to studio art. I was so used to using art as a means of self-expression that doing graphic design, while it's definitely, I mean, it's very challenging. It's its own thing. Um, it was, it, to me, the catering to a client was really difficult. I couldn't, I had a really hard time separating those things for myself. So I made the switch. And even at that time, you know, the dream was, okay, like, you know, I'll make, I'll be able to make art, but like, what can I, what can I still do to make a living? So even at that moment, I think it wasn't like a full, I knew it existed. I knew people could um, be artists for a living, but I didn't know if that was possible for me. So uh, I decided to go to grad school after that for to, in fine arts. So then I could teach at a grad, uh, like I got at a college level. Um, so then supplement like income and all that stuff. So, you know, do this adjunct teaching thing and then and then make art as much as whatever I could do to support art making. That's what I wanted to do. So um, to make it, I guess I realized going into college that it was a possibility, but I never knew that it was a possibility for me um, until I was into college. Was there ever a point that perhaps your mom came back to you and say, you know what, that was a good choice for you. You worked out well. Has that ever <laughs> happened to you? <laughs> She has never said that to me, um, but I know that <laughs> I know, I know such a, yeah. yeah. Um, she has told me that she's proud. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's happened. And that was very, that was a rare moment. Um, and I mean, I, I know that she's happy for me now, you know, and of course, like looking back on it, mm -hmm. it, it, it makes sense. I, you know, I'm glad she's, I'm sure she's glad everything happened the way it happened, but yeah, I think there were probably a few years there where she was like, mm, I don't know, you know, you're taking on more student debt for this master's and maybe that's not a good choice and all that stuff. But I mean, she's always, you know, she's just looking out. I get it. Like now that I'm older yeah. too, you know, it's like, oh yeah, of course, like that makes sense. She just wants me to be, um, wants me to be okay, you know, but I took some risks and I think, I think she's, she's happy. Well, at what point did, for example, where was the, the benchmark? that led to that conclusion, at least, at least for you, like, wow, I, I, 
I made it. I mean, I'm here. I'm working as an artist. I accomplished this main goal that I wanted to do. And perhaps that was the thing that kind of helped her to realize that, well, you know, she got this. <laughs> um, I don't know if there was necessarily a benchmark, like a, mo like a moment that like, it was like, oh, this is it. Um, but I think, so I started doing full-time art in 2016. Um, and at that time, you know, that was still like, still precarious. Like, you know, you're not sure like when the next piece is going to sell that kind of thing. And I very much think it's like, um, like a small business where they, they say like, you don't turn a profit for the first like three to five years, that kind of whatever. Um, it definitely felt like that, like that, you know? Um, but I would say her watching my progress on Instagram, like seeing the growth of my Instagram, um, seeing like the more shows I do and just kind of like seeing it consolidated into like one place, um, helped give her like more confidence in, in what I was doing. So no, no one moment, but I think just like the steady progression. Well, social media has been a big part of your history as well with art has been uh, enabling you to really showcase and create a whole different window. Was, were you always some, somebody driven or excited about social media or you kind of did it because it was something that most of the artists found and a platform to showcase the work? So I got onto social media in 2014, like Instagram on 2014. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, like my, I'm 35. And so when I was in high school, Facebook was just becoming a thing. Yeah. And it was only like for the college kids. So at the time, the idea of social media, I guess there was MySpace, but um, social was media that? was, <laughs> I know, right? I know. Kids, kids right now have no idea what MySpace is. <laughs> so I would say MySpace was like the pioneer of like social yeah. media in terms of like just sharing personal things about yourself with strangers. Um, at least that's my experience. Uh you know, MySpace was just this, like, it was just like a fun little thing that you would do where you had a profile for yourself and you'd listed all your likes and dislikes and music you liked and whatever. Um, and of course, mostly it was just people you knew following each other, yeah. but yeah, then Facebook came out and that was just, it was more personal. Um, so I never saw social media as like, um, like as an art outlet, like as a way to share art, but yeah, then Instagram popped up and it was this image sharing app that was, I was like, oh my gosh, like this feels so natural. I never, I never really, I don't know when Twitter came out, but I was never interested in that. You know, I just, mm -hmm. I, I saw the Instagram was about images and I thought, oh, this is really cool. Like this is, I could do this. Like this seems easy and natural. So yeah, I signed up in 2014. Um, and it wasn't until like 2015 when I really started posting my work. And I used it as a way to just sort of, um, I had graduated and I really wanted to just share. I was used to having eyes on my work because I was in school. Um, and so I wanted to have a way to just share and have other people see the work. And it's just maybe like a, an accountability tool almost, you know, like making sure I'm working and having a studio practice and, and dedicated. And so like, if I, if I take a picture and I share it, then like, there it is, you know, I, I've done it. Um, but, and I also really want to just connect with other artists, other people. Um, so I wouldn't say that I was always drawn to social media. It just, that just was something that coincided at the right time, the right place. and was just such a, such an easy, um, tool to use that it was, it felt very natural. Tell me a little bit about those early days when you graduated school and you're really trying to, you know, make a name for yourself. Were you planning, were you, do you have a specific, not goals, but like objectives, like I want to produce an X amount of work every month or every quarter, you know, I want to, were you setting up goals for you or uh, things to pursue in those early days? I didn't have goals like that. I mean, I did. Yes, I did have goals um, as a, as a way to, so, you know, I think what happens for a lot of people is after you graduate, you're used to having this space and time to have your studio practice. You know, you're in school and that's all it's about. It's just your work and making sure you're in the studio and you're making it. And after school, there's this big jumble of like, oh my gosh, well, like, how do I pay rent? And how do I, how do I live and all this stuff? So your time changes. Um, and you may not have as much time. You definitely won't have enough time 
as much time to dedicate to your studio practice. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was more about uh, my goals were more like be in the studio every day, even if it's just for an hour, um, just making sure that I was in the studio every day. Um, so it wasn't something as quantifiable as like, oh, I finished a piece and here it is, or like, you know, 10 pieces by the end of the month or something like that. But, um, you know, just making sure that I gave, gave myself that time. And by doing that, it became routine. You know, it's like wherever I could fit in a studio, like a little studio session, I would do it. So while that may not be, I, I couldn't stay too strict with it because it's like, I, I need to be in the studio every day at five. And it's mm -hmm. like, sometimes whatever I was doing wouldn't allow me to do that. So as long as I could get in, um, that was the, that was the initial goal. Um, yeah, I don't think, and I think, I mean, I think eventually, like, I think I had a goal of like, I want to do a show. I want to be in like a group show, or I just want to make sure that I'm showing my work. So that was like the next, the next. What is like, I'm used to in Dallas, I'm assuming, correct? I am in Dallas. Yeah. Yes. So what was like, the art community then 10 years ago when you started in Dallas it is a very you know driven city when it comes in great art in the museums there's a great community over there as well but how was for you to get to know and immerse yourself in that community so uh when I moved here I moved here in at the end of 2015 and I remember before I moved I had like been on Instagram looking at um some of the Instagram, like hashtags, like Dallas art or whatever, and just seeing like what the scene was like, you know, what was being posted and all that. And so I th that was a good way to sort of grasp like the feel, at least digitally. Um, and when I got here, I uh, had found an artist. His name is Will Heron. Um, I found an artist that was doing, he had his own studio and he was doing like a show out of the studio. And so I just like, I just went um, and I introduced myself and he was like my first art friend here. Um, I mean, I, I, you know, I knew people from when I lived, when I lived here, uh, like in high school and stuff, but, um, yeah, he was my, my first like grown up art friend. <laughs> um, and it was really nice because he was very connected with other, other artists in the city. Um, and I would say, I mean, I still feel this way, but at the time it was just so, there are a lot of artists here and they were all trying to just do their thing, work, um, make art. And it wasn't, it didn't feel competitive. There was no like, like stepping on each other to get further ahead, like that kind of vibe. Um, it was all very supportive. Like everyone was down to meet, you know, or like, um, like exchange ideas or just, you know, you'd run into each other at shows. Um, so it was really easy to connect and kind of like get yourself into this, the, the culture of the artists. Um, but I actually, you know, I find that like more, as more time has gone on, um, most of my time is just spent in the studio. So like, I'm not, I'm not actively like out, you know, like socializing and stuff unless it's for something specific. So yeah, I'm glad I did that at the beginning. Cause otherwise I think it would just be very much like a, like a hermit situation. Are you busy, right? You gotta produce those sculptures won't make themselves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think one thing I think is interesting about your work. And I want to hear your thought on this. Is there's, there's often there's a blur line between art and, and like a, a science project. Mm -hmm. And is that something? Is is, is is was designed that way? Now, of course, you have an, an aesthetic, you have a, a vision, things that you you know how to pursue and how to accomplish that. But in the early, right in the beginning, was that the goal? Was it to create something so unusual and different, or kind of just happen spontaneously? So I think early on. The goal wasn't to be original. That's, you know, to me, that's, that's a, that's a pretty hard thing to do. So I think that wasn't like what I was thinking, but what I really wanted was to find my voice. I remember there being very, very big on that was like, you know, developing my style and my voice. And so that was kind of like the focus. Um, and then, you know, out of that came like the, the, I guess the original the originality aspect. And so like when I'm, when I do other interviews and stuff and I'm asked the question of like, like about uniqueness or originality, it's like, well, you know, I can't say we can't, it's a strive to be original is really difficult, but you are as an individual original, you are the only one like you. Um, we have a lot of, all have a lot of similarities and, but we also have our differences and uniqueness. So like, if you try to find your voice and your style, then, 
um, your original, your originality comes out through that. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, did I answer all of your questions? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I, I think the idea of colors as well is something that people really gravitate. Is that, is that color, the use of color fundamental to your vision or would you ever be open to consider, you know, to explore the same aesthetic, but without color whatsoever? Like, yeah. So, I mean, color is, yes, I, I, I would say it is fundamental. It's, um, it's hard because there are moments in my practice in making a sculpture where maybe it's just white for a second, you know, and there have been times where um, white or black. And there have been times where someone has come into the studio and they'll be like, oh, that one, the, the all black one. And I'll be like, oh, it's not done. <laughs> That's just like not finished. Um, and they're like, oh my God, but I love it. It's, you know, it's so, you, it's so, I haven't seen one like this from you because it's all black or all white. And it's really interesting because to me, I think I don't see it as finished. It's, it doesn't seem done um, without color. So I do think that it's fundamental. It would be an interesting like studio exercise or thought exercise, I guess, but actually doing it um, to explore the work with like just one single color or um, I don't know, but my tendency is just is towards like this sort of maximalist thing. It's like, I gotta, it just, I don't know. It, it feels very like, it's almost like a need. Like I have to cover the thing in color. Do you feel like that's perhaps your favorite part of the process when it's time to, you know, inject color in the sculptures? I think, yes. So playing with colors is, is one of my favorite parts. It's such a, it's complex, you know, like there's, there's so many things about color and like, what is, what is the color conveying? What is the feel of the piece based on the color? Um, how are these colors interacting with one another? So it's just such a rich um, element to the piece that that I think it makes me I can spend a lot of time thinking about it and there's just so many variations of color too so there's just it's infinite you can just keep like playing with color and and seeing what it can do that it it's I feel like it's never ending on the other side of the coin what is the most tedious part of the process I wouldn't say it's tedious um I wouldn't call it that because I I do enjoy all parts of the process, but, um, I would say applying the texture takes the longest. Mm -hmm. Um, and the thing about my, the way I work is, um, it usually, I'm usually working on multiple pieces at a time. And so if, you know, I have like a few pieces that are curing, I'll move and work on, uh, a few other pieces that are maybe requiring texture at that point. So, um, yeah, I think the the texture or application of texture usually is just it's more time consuming, but it's more meditative. You know, I'm I'm very honed in on what's going on and very focused. And so it just there's like a rhythm to it that emerges. I'm curious and I want to go back a little bit. It was is that anything that you took away from that one year of graphic design school that you implement today? Something that kind of stuck with you that was valuable lesson and it's still around you still kept it around yeah i mean so one thing that i really did i when you ask the question the first thing that comes up is um for for we had to do a lot of thumbnails a lot of thumbnails that was like i remember i think now that i in having like graduated so long ago um i remember hearing that like they the school the professors they had to stop um <laughs> assigning so many thumbnails because I think it was like almost like a hazing process um something like that but I do remember like it's sort of like a numbers game you know you just you do a bunch of thumbnails and you get all your possible ideas out all the different iterations of something and out of the hundreds of thumbnails that you do there's gonna be like a handful that you're like oh yeah that's really that that has something that has potential and so I don't do that it's not super possible with that for, for my work. But sometimes when I do, like if I'm working on a show or something, you know, and I have like 10 little sculptures and I can try each one in a different color way. And then the textures can be different. And once I'm done with those, then I'm like, oh, this one, actually, I want it 
do this one, but at a larger scale, because I just love the way it looks, you know, or there's something about this loop that I want to see larger. So there's something about like doing, executing all the ideas um, in some way that maybe helps you grasp it on a bigger level. Do you pay attention to criticism or perhaps uh, people's opinion about your work when you have a ex new exhibition, new piece, you can re you know receive praises, but also people sometimes don't quite get it. Is that something that you pay attention to it or is it just more background noise? I try to just let it be background noise. Um, same with praise, actually. I, I try not to, I don't, I mean, compliments are fine. You know, it's like, who doesn't like a compliment? But like, <laughs> but if it's coming from someone that I really um, like maybe respect their opinion, then I'm more open to listening. But when it's stuff that's like either like, you know, something I have to read, like a review or something like that, I just don't read it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I would say that I'm pretty good about not letting it get under my skin if there's something I don't like that I'm reading. But I just don't know. Like I, I went through grad school. So it's like I already did the whole critique thing. You know, it's like, do I have to keep doing that? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. You got a, a thick skin for that now. Can't handle it yeah. anymore. Yeah. And I'm, you know, like, um, so the, I think about this one. Uh, I did this piece for a museum here in Dallas um, called the National Sculpture Center. And it was a very big deal for me. I, um, made this large sculpture and, you know, it showed at the museum and it was just this sort of like full circle thing. Cause I went, I grew up going to this museum and it's one of my favorites. And so to have a piece there was like, Oh my gosh, like, this is a, this is a big deal. And, um, I was very proud, very happy. And then a friend of mine sent me uh, a review that had been written about the piece. Um, it was published on this, this Texas based uh, like art website, I guess, um, art publication. And they, it was a former professor of mine, one that I didn't have for, I didn't get to know him. I didn't have any classes with him, but he and I had like crossed paths and he was the one who wrote this review. And I was like, Oh, like I have, I have to read it. Like I can't, I couldn't resist, <laughs> you know? Um, so I broke one of my own rules of like not reading that stuff. And I read it. And of course, like it was just, it was funny because his criticism of that piece was his criticisms of my work when I was in undergrad. It was the same thing. It was like, it's too, one of his criticisms was she's too popular. She's, and I, and I was just like, what can I do about that? Like, what could I possibly do about being too popular? I don't, I don't have control over that. And so, you know, like that kind of stuff, like it, it bothered me, but at the same time, it's like, first his opinions, they don't matter. Right. Like it's, there's what, I also can't do anything about his opinions. Um, but yeah, it was just one of those things. Like I was like, Oh, I was excited to read about, you know, like what my, what a former professor had to say. And of course it was like kind of negative and, um, but anyway, yeah, <laughs> I digress. You know, often enough when I read, uh, critics or no, no, about movies, anything, right? Like books, exhibitions, I find, and perhaps this could be the case when I read it about, I find that tells me more about the critic self than the art or the artist. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's almost like their opinion, as you mentioned, it's the same opinion he had previously when you're going to school. That tells me more about him then tell me more about the work that he's critiquing. Absolutely. So I think, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting concept. If we start looking, when I try to read things like that, I try to see it on that aspect. What is this person telling about the artist or the piece that he's reviewing or she's reviewing, but how much of their own fears, uh, regrets, excitements, bias is there? So is, I think I like to play that game. So maybe perhaps something, you know, similar in the future. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's and that's actually it's interesting that you say that because that's that's how I that's sort of the gist of what I got out of it too was like um he just yeah, it was like he's projecting, you know, like all of his these, this this negativity is like I don't know, like are you is it really about me and my work or is it just something that you're you have a bone to pick with, like, you know? Um so yeah, I think that's a great approach to it because because yeah, like the, a critic can't Unless they're really giving like a like an analysis of the work, right? And it's a yeah. little bit more objective, then they don't know you, they don't know your work. 
Um, and all they have to work with is what's going on in them. And I experienced that in, gr in grad school too, when I was receiving critiques from professors. And at a certain point, I actually realized like, you know, there were some professors that just didn't get it. They, they, just, they just didn't get what I was trying to do. And their critiques were so based around their own practice. And it became like very obvious to me, you know, if I didn't approach something the way they would approach it, then it was wrong. And it's just like, no, we're just, we're different people. Like we have different approaches. That's okay. But that's how I started to kind of um, filter out what I need, should take versus leave out as far as criticism from professors. Yeah, critique for me is almost an, 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 another example of an art form. And, and, and unfortunately, sometimes we, people weigh too much power on those few that can have an outlet and, you know, a uh, platform to, to do that. But uh, I'm with you on that 100%, 100%. But I want to ask about, not critique, but I want to ask, what was the best compliment you have ever got? Um, at one of my shows early on, uh, someone came up to me and said, I, I didn't know this person. It was just someone who was attending the show and they attended it with a group. They came up to me and they said, um, I don't normally like art, but I really, really like, like your art. <laughs> and, um, and I was like, I was like, oh, like oh, oh my gosh, like, thank you. Of course, like, that's amazing. But it really made me think like, you know, the fact that, you know, they probably weren't planning on going to the show or they were just tagging along with their group and they happened upon something that, that they ended up liking. And to me, it's like, that's cool if I opened a little door for them, you know, like they previously thought, I, d I don't like art, but I like this art. So maybe there's other art, there's more art out there that that I can like. So I really I thought that that was really nice that um, maybe my work had done a little something for them in that way. I have a series of uh, rapid fire questions for you. So I'm going to throw them out there and you give them as you can. Uh, okay. All right. What's the best perk of being you? Being myself. Something you wish you were better at. Oh, <laughs> um, maybe rapid fire questions. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. Uh, what's a guilty pleasure? Oh, like late night snacks. <laughs> if you had the chance to go back in time and hang out with your younger self for a whole day, well, what both of you would do? What do you do? Probably like go on a hike. Do you have a secret talent? <laughs> I'm pretty good at uh, Olympic weightlifting. Really? Yeah. How much are you lifting now? I mean, like, <laughs> um, a cl like a clean. I do like 135, 135 pounds. Wow. How long have you been lifting now? How, what what got you into it? <laughs> um, now we're going to stay here for a little bit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I started lifting. I started with CrossFit. I think that's like a, the gateway for a lot of people into lifting. Um, but I started at least 10 years ago and then, um, that's where I got introduced to Olympic weightlifting and I loved it. I was just like, oh my gosh, it's so technical. There's so many components. It's so efficient. Um, and so that's kind of like what got me down or got me on that path. Um, but yeah, I've been lifting for like, say like 15 years now. It's amazing. Yeah. See, I'm glad I asked that question. Look at this. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. I'm very excited about this. Um, can you recommend us a book? Okay, it can be your favorite books. It can be something that you read recently. Whatever you think we should pick you read. Um, so right now, I would say currently, um, if if you're a creative person, or even if you're not, if you think you're not a creative person, um, The Creative Act by Rick Rubin is really, really good. Um, I think, I mean, it's very simple. It's very thoughtful and simple in a good way. Not simple in like, you know. Um, so I recommend that. Uh, for like a nonfiction, for a fiction, um, I just read this book by a Korean author whose name I can't remember, but the book's name is Almond. And it's a great, just like a, such an interesting story, but it was, it's about this kid who was born without, a, a, he was born with smaller size amyg amygdala. I can't say the word, but um, he was born with a smaller part of his brain and it's where the emotions are uh, controlled or developed. And so he grows up without like having emotions. Um, and it's just how he navigates that. And then like, tr like some tragedy strikes and it's just really, really interesting perspective it's called Almond. Wow. Yeah. Sounds fascinating. What about, uh, um, a movie or TV show, something to watch? 
I mean, when I'm like in the studio, one of my favorite shows of all time is It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Um, there's a ton of seasons. It's hilarious. It's it's a it's a great like comfort show for me. Although I've heard a lot of people say like they don't like how much yelling happens <laughs> on that show. Um, but it's really funny. So it's it's a nice like kind of background studio show that I listen to. And who do you think we should invite to be a guest podcast next? Um, so she's a acquaintance slash friend of mine. Her name is Grace Lee Lawrence. She's an artist out of New York. Um her work is just really, really interesting. And I think, I think she'd be an interesting guest for you. How did you meet Grace? We met through a mutual friend, um, but mainly through social media. Like, you know, I, we follow each other and I keep up with her work that way. Um, and we've met in person once. Um, so we connected that way too. So yeah, she's, she's just, her work is just so different. And of course, you know, like, as you know, like I, I value like a strong voice, a strong style. So I'd say she has both of those. So let's see if you were able to ask her one question, if I have her in a podcast and I can ask her one question on your behalf, what would it be? Hmm. Oh my gosh. I don't know. Um, maybe what is something, something completely unexpected in her life that inspires her work? Something that people wouldn't expect or draw a connection to. All right. Yeah. Make a, make a mental note for that one. Um, if you could be remembered for just one thing, what would that be? Um, I mean, so it's, I, I would say the obvious answer I think for me would be my work, but also, I don't know if it matters. I don't really know if, if, it, if that, if being remembered for something matters to me. Um, but otherwise, yeah, my work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Dan, this is it. Thank you so much for joining me. I had a blast getting to know you a little bit more, hear about your work, your background, and I'll find out all your secrets about you know, weightlifting and all those exciting things. And uh, I'm thrilled we got the chance to make this work. Same. Thank you so much for having me. Your questions were great. Um, and I think I'll practice rapid fire questions like while I'm working in the studio. <laughs> for the next time, just put it. Yeah. <laughs>